Do you have children? I do. Did you have to talk to them about I that do. one? Do. My wife actually. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's roundtable, <coughs> Post Hong Kong Human Genome Editing's Brave New World. And I welcome to those who are also joining us online. I'm uh, J. Stephen Morrison. I'm the Senior Vice President here at CSIS and Director of our Global Health Policy Center. We're delighted today to be able to stage this conversation jointly with the National Academy of Medicine. And we're especially grateful to its president, Dr. Victor Zhao, one of today's roundtable speakers, and also very grateful to his colleague, Morgan Connerick, for all their generous efforts to make today possible. We're also very grateful to the other distinguished experts who are joining this roundtable here. Uh, Tim Hunt, next to Victor, Senior Vice President, Corporate Affairs at Editas. Anne-Marie Maza, welcome Anne-Marie, Senior Director, Committee on Science, Technology, and Law at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, and Jeffrey Kahn, Director Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. And among my colleagues at CSI, I wish to single out for special thanks and praise, Samantha Strom and Emily Munden. Today's event is under the auspices of the CSIS Commission on Glo Strengthening America's Health Security, which is a two-year effort co-chaired by Kelly Ayotte and Julie Gerberding. One of the priority areas of that is, in fact, what concerns us today. The swift evolution of new technology, CRISPR in this instance today, and the tr tr tremendous opportunities that these discoveries open along with the uncertain dangers they create and the urgent challenge to think through carefully and thoughtfully what norms, regulations, protocols, both hard and soft, are going to be appropriate and feasible in the United States context and globally. And these, co these complex challenges which cross-cut science, technology, ethics, politics, and policy sit today at the very center of health security. Our principal focus today is germline heritable gene editing, the editing of eggs, sperms, and embryos, though as we will soon see, we're not confining ourselves to that topic alone. It's vitally important to put germline editing into the broader context and take account of somatic cell editing. I was struck in preparing for today just how existential this topic is. Um, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, the, the um, author of the gene, recently remarked, what it means to be human is changing. Our increasing knowledge and ability to manipulate our genes, the fundamental units of heredity and the basic units of biological information are altering our notion of who we are. And as a result, humans are facing, faced with figuring out new language, new regulations, and new answers to all sorts of very fundamental questions. Germline engineering involves, quote, changing not just any cell in the body, but cells that make sperms, eggs, or embryos themselves, hence the bright line distinction is that whatever change you make will be transmitted across generations. This raises strong moral hazards, and it opens the door to such controversial topics as selective breeding, genetic enhancement, and cloning. It also opens the door to alleviate human suffering in new ways. Mukherjee commented, I want us to think and pause before we move forward. I'm a physician, so the idea of the suffering of people, partly caused by genes, cancer is a great example, is not lost on me. Today's event grows directly from Dr. J.K. Hu's announcement in November in Hong Kong that he had made heritable genetic changes in human embryos, implanted them, resulting in the birth of the twins, Nana and Lulu, and that there was an additional pregnancy. Um, that disturbing di disclosure drove an intensified debate created a sense of urgency, drew an immediate and universal condemnation, and stirred action in several spheres, which we're going to hear about shortly. All four of our speakers today were in Hong Kong, and each has been integral and very active in attempting to answer the question, where do we go from here? The academies from the US, UK, also in China, have pushed ahead with plans to establish an international commission that would focus on the scientific research pathway that might lead to future clinical applications. We'll hear about that today. The newly launched WHO Committee, the Expert Advisory Committee on Developing Global Standards for Governance and Oversight of Human Genome Editing, co-chaired by Peggy Hamburg, met just last week and announced as an initial step the creation of a registry 
One clear challenge, and I hope we'll hear about this today, is how these two processes will be aligned and how they will complement one another. Hong Kong has also spurred debate over whether there should be a five-year moratorium, as argued in Nature on March 14th, signed by 18 prominent experts, modeled after the decision taken in the mid-70s at Asilomar in California with regard to the then very new recombinant DNA. Other experts have pushed back on the call for a moratorium, questioning the feasibility, the timeline, what would be the boundaries, what authority would enforce it. Many experts have, have questioned whether there really is a debate or a true division in the scientific community, moratorium versus an alternative, or whether these differences are largely semantic, and that they may, our division may mask the reality that there's a serious underlying consensus on what the rules of the road need to be looking into the future of genome editing. If that, under that argument, the emphasis seems to be that what is required is to refine and think far more carefully on what needs to happen to operationalize shared principles. Hong Kong raised the question of which scientists outside China, in particular in the United States, knew of Dr. Hu's work, but chose to remain silent. There the question is, should they have spoken up, and if so, to whom? And what kind of ethical infrastructure is required for cases like this? It also raised, Hong Kong also raised the fundamental question of whether Dr. Hu is a rogue or part of a star system of scientists following the cues and rewards and incentives within the system in China. We really seek to answer today where we are post Hong Kong and what needs to happen next. The debate is fully upon us. I think we, it's pretty clear there is a shared sense of urgency and a need to show action. Things are moving rapidly, as we'll hear about the commission and about these other steps. I don't believe we're on the verge of a designer baby or designer soldier generation appearing suddenly, but there is anxiety and uncertainty hanging in the air. Who can be trusted? There will be bad actors, no doubt, and there will be continued pressures to try to minimize bad actors, but there also will be intensifying commercial pre pressures for, for enhancement for medical tourism, and bad actors will seek dark corners to meet that demand a phase of ethical dumping, some are arguing, may lie ahead. How will we know if the new strengthened approaches emerging from the academies and the WHO advisory committee will be successful? And what if they are not successful? For us in the United States, we need to ask if the current prohibition on clinical use of gene editing should be permanent, and what are the consequences for us scientifically and in terms of our regulatory preparations? And finally, and arguably most importantly, what's become of these two children, Lulu and Nana? And what is their, what is, how will they be cared for looking ahead? For the next several minutes, we're going to hear quick opening remarks from our roundtable speakers. We'll then have a conversation among ourselves. Following that, we'll open up to you for questions and comments. We'll bring microphones to you. We'll bundle together several responses. Please be very succinct. Just identify yourself and offer a quick remark or comment. And then as we get towards the very close, I'll ask our speakers to offer some, some final remarks. So I'm going to turn to, to Victor Zhao first and ask him to explain the technology and explain how we got to this point. Victor, thank you and welcome. Thank you. How do we get to this point? Well, you and I had a conversation two months ago. You asked me, what was I doing with my life? I said, I'm really busy with this whole thing after Hong Kong on uh, genome editing. And we had this idea we should have a public meeting. And thank you for organizing this. How many people read the Huxley book on the brave new world? So the younger people, oh, they read it too. I think all of us were must read when we were growing up, right? So I think about Huxley, 1932, talk about a society of genetic modified human beings able to stratify the societal hierarchy through inter intelligence and being able to manipulate thinking, sleep conditioning, psychological manipulation. Pretty scary. But in 1932, we didn't even know how to spell DNA. But that being said, we are actually at the verge of all those things today. This is why this topic is so important. So when you think about uh, genome editing, I would say this is probably one of the most important advances scientifically of the decade, if not the century. 
is the ability to actually manipulate the genome in a precise fashion. So how does it work? Uh, there are several already uh, genome editing techniques, but the one that's most popular right now, because it's easy to use, uh, is very effective, is CRISPR-Cas9. So bacteria has a system that defends itself from viruses. When viruses come into a bacteria, it's able to identify sequences where it can use an enzyme called endonuclease to remove it. And about seven years ago, Jennifer Doudner and Emmanuel Charpentier said they adapted to the system to mammalian cells. And what really the technique involves is first a guide RNA. A guide RNA that says, I want to specifically identify sequences on the genome. And then coupled with this Cas9 endonuclease, we cut it exactly where it is. So now it's known as a molecular scissor. You can cut specific sequences on the genome, wherever you want it to be targeted, and you can even replace it. So quickly you can imagine that we can start thinking about diseases, right? I mean, there are so many diseases that are genetically based or genetically influenced, but why not apply this towards, in fact, treating diseases? And that's where the starting point is. You know, quickly, of course, when you think about disease and the ability to eliminate the genome so precisely or to replace one gene for another, quickly you also think about how do you make everybody as good looking as me? I'm teasing. <laughs> so the whole idea of enhancement, right? So the debate becomes disease or enhancement. I would say that most people would argue enhancement, we're not ready for this because not only the society, if you do surveys, say no way, but also the, the genetics of intelligence looks all this stuff is very complex. Whereas you begin to look at disease, it's easy to use imagination to say, I know what a genetic disease, mutation, whatever it is, and I can actually go in and fix it. And this is where the excitement is. Now, I just want to say that, in fact, when you apply this technique, you think about really two domains. One is somatic. Somatic, the other one's germline. Somatic simply means that if I were to give you the CRISPR-Cas9 into you, uh, into your tissue, or into a cell, I can fix the gene in that tissue and cell. That does not require getting into embryos, and then, as Steve said, it changes your genetic makeup in generations forever. That's quite acceptable, at least you hear from my colleagues about where they are. But the question is, how do you imagine doing this? So sometimes you try to fix a gene, and sometimes you simply want to change the gene because it influences a biologic process. I'll give you two quick examples, and I want to move on, make sure that we talk about the main thing. So for example, we know in HIV, there's a co-receptor called CCR5. And the HIV virus gets into T cells through this receptor. And that's when you destroy the T cells. And that's make you immune deficient. Now, many of you know there are two cases of uh, HIV cures in the world. What happened to those individuals, they happened to get bone marrow transplant from the donors whose CCR5 gene is mutated and it's not working. And so guess what? After they received it, suddenly the HIV is cured. So people are now doing this, and this is already in phase two trials with several hundred patients involved, in mutating CCR5 in the T cells of patients with HIV, then looking at when you put it back, do you actually reduce the viral load and reduce the need for uh, triple therapy? And the answer so far looks really promising. So that's one condition. The other one would be Experimentally, we know that uh, it's possible now to remove a gene or inactivate a gene called PCSK9, which is involved in cholesterol regulation. It's not the only gene, but when you remove that in the mouse, guess what? Cholesterol comes down. So I can imagine, I only give it to you in the liver, that's where it is, that you can actually almost like long, right? Lower your cholesterol level. So that's totally possible, at least in the future. One last thing. So in somatic therapy, 
People are also thinking about sickle cell thalassemia. You might have seen 60 Minutes about gene therapy in sickle cell. But well, that was still using the older method. But now imagine that you can actually treat sickle cell by taking stem cells from bone marrow and do a transplant, right? Or you can take even skin cell and make a stem cell called IPS and then put it back to patient. So all that is possible and are being actively investigated. In fact, when you look at uh, clinicalchart.gov, there must be about 18 trials, most of them in China, looking at HIV or condition I talked to you about, or in cancer. Germline is a very different issue. Right? Germline means that you take an embryo. As Steve said, people are even thinking about sperms or egg, but mainly embryo. And then to edit the gene in the embryo, so the embryo is passed on you know, to the next generation, et cetera. So you basically can potentially not only prevent, but cure the disease for multi-generations. That's when the controversy occurs. You're changing genetics makeup for multiple generations forever. And what are the ethical and other domains around this? I'm going to stop here by simply saying that I want to tee up the fact that somatic, actively investigated, and you hear about from others, what do we recommend in somatic therapy? And then there's germline, which is, in fact, the issue of controversy. Now, how do we get involved? As Steve said, in 1975-74, there was a call for moratorium for recombinant DNA because at the time, for the first time, uh, people were able to clone a bacteria. And so suddenly, the scientists got together and said, wait a minute, recombinant DNA could have great implication to us in society and to security. So they called a moratorium. And the National Academies were the one that got together a Silomar conference in 75 that got together you know, scientists to say, what do we do? The outcome was that together, they say, we should go forward with science because it's great for society, but we should have strict guidelines. And that's really happened. Some 40 years later, you know what the common DNA technology is doing. We're now facing a very similar issue for journal editing. There's a moratorium to say we should stop. And we at the National Academy are saying, OK, we're going to convene and actually see if we can come up with consensus agreement. So in 2015, three of my council members came to talk to me and say we should do something like Silma because this technology is getting of great concern. I went to speak to the former uh, National Academy of Science president, the late Ralph Cicerone, who actually were approached also by his members. So together we formulated the first summit in 2015. And I'm sure Anne-Marie and others will tell you more about this. So that's the background. Thank you, Victor. Anne-Marie, why don't you pick up the story in terms of the Academy's engagement and the different steps in terms of summits, uh, convening commissions, and, and looking forward. Great. Thank and why you, do we need all of this work? <laughs> keeps us employed, no, I shouldn't say that. Um, so um, uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I have been asked to tell you a bit about the journey that we went from, went through from the 2015 summit to the 2017 study and then to Hong Kong and the announcement by Dr. He. I should say that I helped staff the committee that organized the 2015 summit and the 2018 summit. My colleague, Katie Bowman, who's here in the audience, was the study director for the 2017 um, study. So I, in taking you through this journey, I want to remind you that while 2018 seemed really exciting, in 2015, it was really exciting. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 was really coming into, um, uh, is getting a lot of attention. People were um, talking about it. We were seeing more papers come out about it. Jennifer Downow, one of the earlier, uh, early um, leaders in this field, had convened a meeting in Napa with a bunch of scientists and ethicists and legal scholars to talk about the promise of this technology, but also to address some of the concerns about the ethics, about regulation, about governance. And at the end of that uh, meeting, that group issued a paper called A Prudent Path Forward. And in their paper, they said that there was a need for um, basic research and we should continue that there was um, a need for ethicists and uh, scientists to talk with each other, that there was a need for a global discussion. They also said that germline editing should not be um, done at this time. They discouraged it. 
following that article, there also was the publication of uh, a research paper by a group of Chinese scientists um, indicating that they had used CRISPR-Cas9 on non-viable human embryos. And that received an awful lot of international attention. There were congressional hearings that year. The Economist had a, a, a picture of a beautiful baby, a, a designer baby, uh, um, and uh, suggested that you, know, you could design, edit this baby so that it wouldn't be bald, so it would have perfect pitch and a, and a high IQ. <laughs> um, and that year also, Science uh, Magazine uh, deemed uh, CRISPR-Cas9 the breakthrough of the year. So with all of that, um, the Academy decided to organize an international summit on human genome editing. Recognizing the international nature of this, we asked our colleagues at the Royal Society and the Chinese Academy of Science to join us in organizing this committee. And we put together um, an international committee uh, that was going to uh, convene in, 20, in December of 2015. The committee was chaired by Dr. David Baltimore, who's um, at Caltech and was at Asilomar um, many years earlier. That summit was really intended to be the start of a discussion with the scientific community, with ethicists, with lawyers, with the public. And it focused on where the science was at the present time, what the technologies were, what the potential applications were, and of course, a lot of the societal issues and governance issues. It explored this issue of disease and the use of disease, uh, these treatments to cure disease, but it also raised issues about disabilities um, and whether it should be used in disability and who gets to decide what a disability is. We also um, had a wonderful talk in which we were all cautioned uh, about what we know, that um, we are in the early stages of our understanding and that we have to be cautious as we um, proceed. At the end of that meeting, the organizing committee issued a statement and they made four key points. First, they said there was a need for basic and preclinical research and that the current structure governing the way in which we do that research was appropriate and it should begin. I mean, it should continue, excuse me. With respect to clinical applications of gene editing and somatic cells, they said that this too should continue, that there was an appropriate regulatory structure that was in place to, uh, for gene therapy and that it would be appropriate in this, con in this context as well. When they came to the issue of clinical applications of gene editing to human germline, they said no, that at this stage it would be irresponsible to proceed. They said that our understanding wasn't good enough, that there was too much uncertainty about off-target and on-target effects, and there was too much uncertainty about what the risk-benefit would be. They also said that there was a need for a broad um, societal consensus on this, and they called then for the establishment of a forum that would consider broad input and also try to develop norms. That was followed that afternoon um, by um, the convening of the, the study committee that uh, Katie directed. That study committee met for a year, and after a year, they issued their report um, in February of 2017. And they identified a few areas as well. First, with basic research, they again said that we should proceed and that we should use the existing regulatory process. With respect to somatic cells, they said that this application for you should be used to treat disease and to treat disabilities. And again, they mentioned that the regulatory framework that's created for gene therapy was appropriate. With respect to germline cells, they said that they could envision a time where this might be possible to uh, treat uh, serious uh, diseases and um, uh, disabilities, but only when there was a stringent oversight structure put in place, which at the time we didn't have. And then with respect to enhancement, they said germ using germline editing for enhancement was no-go. And with respect to somatic cells, they said that there was a need to have a broader discussion, broader public participation about whether or not you would expand um, the use of somatic cell editing. So in late spring of 2018, we began our plans for the second summit. We did this with the Royal Society again and with the Academy of Sciences of Hong Kong. David Baltimore again served as the chair for this international committee. We wanted to have a meeting in Asia recognizing the global nature of the scientific enterprise. 
And we thought that the meeting would basically be following the path of scientific discovery, that we would find out about how the science had progressed, the issues that were raised in 2015 and 2017, whether they had been addressed, and we'd also consider governance and regulatory perspectives of other nations. When I left for Hong Kong, I wondered if there would be any interest. After all, it was in 2015. And when I landed in Hong Kong on Saturday morning, I opened an email that said, Amory, time for a little chat. So I called for that little chat, and I then learned that Dr. He, would, who was a speaker scheduled on the second day of the summit, would be making an announcement that he had edited uh, uh, the DNA of two baby girls that, were born, that had been born in China. Over the course of the next several days, the next several hours, the next several days, we learned about his work. We learned that he had submitted a manuscript to a scientific journal. We learned that he was going to be publishing an ethics paper. Uh, we also learned that there were videos encouraging people to write emails to Lulu and Nana with him asking you to send in your emails. We also saw a mad rush by the press and the release by MIT um, Tech Review of an exclusive story, uh, Chinese scientists creating CRISPR babies. Our full committee was not in town at that time, and so we were trying desperately to figure out how to organize this and how to keep control of it. And one of the big questions for the committee to wrestle with was whether or not this was a hoax. Was this indeed true? And so we decided to have several of our members meet with Dr. He and talk to him. And they saw some of his slides. I should say that the original slides did not include what he presented in Hong Kong. They, those members of the committee reported back to the full committee. And at that time, the full committee decided that we would go forward with having Dr. He present to the committee and that, excuse me, present to the, at the summit. And um, that we felt there was a, a real need for transparency and a real need for us to understand what exactly um, he did. As you might imagine, pr press were coming in from all around uh, the world. We decided to keep the schedule as, uh, as was originally designed, meaning Dr. Ho would speak on the second day. We did alter it a bit in this regard. We decided that there were so many scientists who were involved on the panel that Dr. Ho was supposed to be on, that they had come all this way to Hong Kong, that they were doing important work, and we wanted to hear from them. So we had them speak first, and then we had questions and answer with them. Then we decided that we would allow Dr. Ho to speak separately from that panel. That two of the members of the committee, Robin Lovell Budge and Badge and Matt Porteous, would then ask him questions first. And our thought was that we wanted them to have an opportunity to ask questions on behalf of the committee so that we could really have the scientific questions that we wanted addressed addressed, and so we could also explore the ethical issues that we wanted to raise with respect to informed consent and monitoring. It was during that Q&A that we learned about the second pregnancy. After Dr. Hus spoke, after his initial Q&A with our members, um, David Baltimore uh, got up. And he repeated again what we had said in 2015, that it was irresponsible to do this work. He said that it was not transparent, that it was not medically necessary, and that it was a failure of self-regulation. We then, of course, had the questions and answers uh, from the audience and the press. At the end of that two and a half day meeting, the organizing committee issued a statement, and they applauded the rapid advances in somatic cell editing they stated clearly that they still believed that it would be irresponsible to do human uh, germline editing. They also noted that this, while there were scientific uncertainties about germline editing, that, as pro that we, they were seeing rapid progress and there was therefore a need to think about a translational pathway. They had called for an independent assessment of Dr. Ho's work and they again criticized it, his uh, work as being irresponsible and called for an ongoing form. So to give you some scale of the difference between the two, I know the, the second was, it was a big deal, but you should just have some sense. At the first summit in 2015, we had um, represented in the audience of about 500, about 20 different countries represented. About 3,000 people watched the live webcast, and there were about 70 countries represented in those viewings. At the Hong Kong meeting, we had over 80,000 viewers watch the live webcast through the NAS's um, uh, website from 100 and almost 190 nations and jurisdictions. 
There were over 200 to 250 press people present, and we had uh, established a special feed with Beijing News that allowed 1.8 million viewers to watch the presentation. So my worry about um, getting any attention um, and having anything to cover um, uh, was not necessary. No, not. So, thank you, Tim. If you could take up the story a bit and tell us from the standpoint of private industry and your firm, which is deeply invested in the somatic therapy side, to share with us your, your thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Steve, and, and thanks to you and the center for having us here. Um, Victor, I thought, did a great job of sort of introducing the promise of somatic cell gene editing. And I'm not a scientist, but I work with a lot of scientists, and we've got some excellent scientists that were founders of our company. And they tell me, just as Victor said, essentially, you need to think of CRISPR gene editing, gene editing in general, CRISPR gene editing in particular, as a once in a generation scientific opportunity, maybe once in a lifetime. It's that powerful. And when they describe the power and promise of gene editing, they are, in talking to me, they're always talking about somatic cell gene editing, which has the potential to transform the lives of patients for whom the status quo too often represents death or serious disability. Death from cancer, death from sickle cell disease, death from beta thal thalassemia, or from rare liver conditions, or serious disabilities like rare forms of blindness or other uh, genetic conditions. Uh, our company, Editas Medicine, working on uh, our most advanced program is for um, a target known as LCA10, which is uh, hopefully someday um, we will have a medicine that could help treat between 2,000 and 5,000 patients, Mo many of them are children, in the U.S. and Europe um, with a rare form of blindness. And we're going to begin our clinical trials the back half of this year. So we're very excited about that and what it may be able to do if we could someday provide a durable uh, product to patients like that. But there is a lot more work that still needs to be done even in somatic cell editing. We are at the very earliest days in many ways. And there are a lot of very talented companies out there, like Sangamo, which was one of the initial pioneers in the field, working on zinc finger technology. Companies like CRISPR Therapeutics, Intellia, Beam, working on base editing, another form of, 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 of essentially a form of gene editing, and other companies. So we think there is an enormous amount of promise and potential in the years ahead, but we're still in the early days. And one of the things we try to do, that we take very seriously, is also how do we responsibly communicate with real patients. So for example, we're very involved with the blindness community. And some people will say, geez, we may have a cure for some of these patients. And we always wave that off and say, you know, we don't want to meet with parents of a blind child or talk to a patient that's blind and say, we think we could cure you. Because that's setting the bar really high. What we may be able to do is improve someone's vision. That would be great. If you can go from seeing light to seeing your parent's face, that would be terrific but you may not be able to drive a car. So we, we, we think, given the early nature of the technology, we want to take things slowly, methodically, run clinical trials over the next many years, and our hope is that together as a field, over the next five to 10 years, we will have some real therapeutics to treat real patients in need. Tim, so. may I just ask you, in regard to Hong Kong, you were there. Yeah. Did you feel like those developments were a threat, inherently a threat, to the work that's under, ongoing on the somatic side? Yes. And tell us a bit why. Yeah, well, I think, look, anybody that's deeply invested in trying to translate the promise and potential of gene editing into real uh, therapeutics for real patients in need, you, you need to watch out for especially rogue actors. And in the case of Dr. Hey. You know, this was an, an outrageous act. Uh, he hit every box kind of falling out of the bad ethical tree on the way down, including a lack of informed consent. I think Jeff will get into these things, and he's the expert on ethics, not me. But it was really deeply, deeply disturbing. And, and uh, I think we could say now it's been clarified, also illegal in China. So it was offensive, deeply disturbing, and um, I think we all need to work together to try to ensure this kind of thing doesn't happen again going forward. One of the remarkable things uh, in watching this from a distance was how immediate and universal the condemnation was. Were you surprised by that? No. No. No, I was glad. 
I was glad it happened. I think times <coughs> like this look, uh, in the theory of self-policing, it only works if people trust the police and when something terrible happens, if people speak up and speak out. And I think it was great that people did do that. And, and in that sense, the more the merrier. Victor, you wanted to add a remark? Yeah, I just wanted to say two things. One is emphasizing what Tim said. Uh, and what Emery said, that is in somatic therapy, we're treating people who are not embryos, but people who are targeted to different tissues. The FDA regulates it really well. There are processes that regulate well. And I feel pretty confident that when done right, this is going to be really helpful to patients. And that need to be emphasized different from the issue of embryo, right. which is what we can talk about. I think the other thing that needs to be emphasized is the fact that, uh, you know, um, when you think about uh, the whole field, you know, science had to pro progress in such a way that it's going to be helpful to humanity. And with the right framework, we can make a huge difference. So I totally agree with what Tim just said. Thank you. Jeffrey, you were there. Um, you were in the earlier, uh, you were at the 15 Summit as well, mm -hmm. correct? Tell us what your reaction was, what your interpretation was on the ethical side of this, what unfolded in Hong Kong. Sure. Um, and I also was a member of the committee that issued the consensus report in 2017. I should disclose that. Um, so it turned out that Anne-Marie and, and I had hotel rooms on the same floor in Hong Kong. And I remember running into you um, that first morning, and you were looking um, sort of ashen. <laughs> not, not because there was so little to talk about, but because things had sort of blown up. So I think we all were um, shocked, uh, sort of aghast, as you've heard others say. Uh, and, and I want to structure, organize my thoughts really just around three uh, three points, and I'll elaborate on each of these a little bit. The first is the, the ethics of the science that was performed and its application. The, and I'm going to talk about each of these in a second. The second is why, we've, we've danced around a little bit, but why Dr. He performed the purported experiment. So what was the, what was the motivation there, and, and what did he say about why he did what he purportedly did? And then the third we've, we've taken on, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my part too, about what to do about what what happened. So, um, Steve, in your introduction, you mentioned what had been a, a bright line distinction between um, germline modification and somatic. And, and among the things that I think is important to say is that the 2017 report, um, in a way, backed away from that bright line distinction for the very first time. That's a really important thing to say. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we all knew that as we were crafting the report and its recommendations. And in fact, that was the reportage that happened on the day of the release, which happened to be Valentine's Day, for reasons I don't remember why we chose that, but that's when it was. And the, the headlines were um, National Academies Committee opens door for germline uh, gene editing. We didn't, we didn't think that was the headline, but that's sort of how it got reported. Um, we, what we said were, was something quite different and more nuanced, of course, than the headline could capture. So we identified seven overarching principles that we thought needed to help in the thinking of governing the, um, the beginning of the of uses of this technology for both somatic and potential germline, uh, which seem generic but, but useful, and they, I'll say them very quickly, promoting the well-being of the individuals affected, transparency, due care, responsible science, respect for persons, fairness, and translational, transnational, pardon me, cooperation. Specifically to human uh, germline uh, gene editing, we said there needed to be 10, what I would say were quite onerous criteria that had to be satisfied before beginning the first clinical trial to do what Dr. He announced he had done in Hong Kong. And, and the, the criteria were, are quite specific about what conditions would satisfy the step across that formerly bright line. It had to be a devastating disease, one that was, uh, would, would result in fatality. No other approach to avoid it. And then uh, lots of discussion about the kind of clinical information, first from basic science and then from non-human animal research, uh, before you would begin to propose going forward and then with much oversight and careful um, study 
and then uh, long-term follow-up of the individuals who might be born. So 10 criteria, which we thought meant would never be satisfied, maybe in the far distant future, but certainly not in 2018. Uh, and I remember being quoted when somebody asked me, do you think this opens the door to germline and editing? I said, no, the door is locked, but we're now saying people can knock on it. And, and maybe we'll think about you know, looking through the peephole and saying, what are you proposing to do? And then let's talk about it. Very different than the door is now open, go do germline genome editing. So what Dr. Hay did, um, did not satisfy the criteria, either the overarching principles or the 10 criteria. The, I think we haven't actually said what he did, or he purportedly did. He modified embryos so that they would have mutated CCR5 genes, so what the, that Victor mentioned. Uh, the, the gene that, that, if it's mutated, will not permit infection with HIV and other viruses. So he modified the genes and the twins that he um, has disclosed were born so that they would be uh, immune, effectively, from HIV infection. It's like a vaccine. That didn't satisfy the criteria about a disease that would be incompatible with life or a devastating illness that could not otherwise be avoided. It turned out that in the cases that he's disclosed, or at least that's what he says without it being verified yet, the, um, the need for this was because the male partner in the couples for whom he was doing this gene editing of embryos were infected by HIV. But it turns out that you can wash sperm. Sperm can be washed in reproductive medicine clinics such that the um, IVF can be performed without infection of the resulting embryos. You don't need to do genome editing of the embryo to prevent HIV infection in the next generation. So it didn't seem to meet the, even the, the first, most basic criteria before going forward. Then there's a question of responsibility. He made embryos, which means you're making humans, before any of that basic science had been performed, which seemed wildly to, to wildly violate the, the norms of science. And, and I think we were all shocked that anybody would do that. The third thing to say about Dr. He is that he, as, as Tim has already mentioned, he was not a charlatan, he was a rogue. It's an important distinction. So he knew how to do the science, and he is, was, I guess, part of the genome editing scientific community. And he had disclosed to that community in small group meetings and in public that he was working in uh, his laboratory in China to do the genetic modification of embryos as he had described. He just wasn't disclosing that he was implanting them into women to help them become pregnant. That's, of course, a huge difference. So he was um, disclosing the science, but he was being secret about the application of the science. Hugely problematic and obviously failing on transparency. He also didn't publish the, his data. No one got to, to see what he was doing on the clinical trial aspect. Um, and Marie mentioned that there was a paper submitted and, and, you know, sort of the, um, the height of irony, or chutzpah, he published an ethics paper. The ethics of research can go forward in this way if so-and-so are followed, and he had already had uh, supposedly babies born. It seemed sort of crazily out of the norm. So it, it didn't meet any of the standards, and I, and I think it's important to say it wasn't the case that he was doing work in a vacuum of, of what people thought the appropriate approach should be. There was a lot of discussion and endorsement of the, um, the principles and these criteria that I've briefly mentioned, although they didn't make it into any kind of governance framework, right? That's, that's a, the important thing to sort of take on as part of our discussion later. All right, the, the second thing I want to touch on is what seemed to be the motivation, and we've heard a little bit about that in, in, mostly in Stephen's introductory remarks. So he claimed that he was doing something with a great public health good benefit by producing uh, children who were now immune from infection to HIV, and that somehow was sufficient to justify going forward for the first time. I think it's fair to say, and this is my interpretation, but I think it's widely shared, that he wanted to be the first to do this and thought that he would be lauded on the international stage as a, um, a pioneer, sort of on the order of the, the people who successfully produced the first test tube baby, Louise Brown, 1978. And it was sort of, when do I get the Nobel Prize? He, he had this attitude that this was a breakthrough that the world would see quite differently than it ended up seeing. And of course, what isn't clear is sort of what kind of support governmentally, institutionally, and in terms of resources were coming from some um, parts of the Chinese government, or at least the institution where he was working. We don't know the answer to that. 
I will say it was interestingly um, quiet from the Chinese government about whether this was something to be applauded or, um, or criticized until the world um, community had spoken. It's my interpretation. So only because I know you want to get to to comments, I'll, I'll be quick about my last thing, which is what to, what to do about this. And you've heard us all talking about commissions that have, have either um, done their work and issued reports or are being formed. The upshot of that is international governance, pretty much around anything, but certainly around uh, leading edge and controversial science, is just really hard. We don't have mechanisms and models um, on which to rely. And I will say, when I was in Hong Kong, as we all were, among the things that I was worried about, as was Tim, is what the reaction was going to be from the US regulatory enterprise. And I remember then Commissioner Scott Gottlieb of the FDA being quoted almost immediately saying, if the scientific community can't regulate this, then maybe the regulators need to step in, which is, of course, your worry, and a rightful one. So um, self-governance has very limited effectiveness, as I think we um, have seen. This proof positive. The Silomar example, which is the 1975 um, self-imposed moratorium that the scientific community agreed to, uh, had, uh, it was a different time, a different environment where a, a tiny handful of scientists, almost all in the UK and in the US, got together and, and agreed to, um, to not perform these experiments uh, for a certain period of time. It's not possible to do that today. We don't have uh, the right small number of people who can all get together and agree to behave one way or another. It's too easy, it's among the things we haven't said, to do gene editing. These tools are too, too easy to use, too um, inexpensive, and require too little expert laboratory or, or human expertise to have that kind of model um, work today. And, I, and the last thing I want to say, because it's been invoked and I, I didn't have it in my notes, but I do want to talk about it, is the distinction between preventing or, or curing disease and not enhancing a human sounds really easy in, as we talk about words, but it's really hard to implement. So the line between um, disease and enhancement <coughs> is, is not as straightforward as it sounds, like a lot of things. Um, and so uh, we can talk about that during the Q&A rather than my droning on about it now. But I think that's a really important part of the discussion. How do we know where the right line is and how do we know how to stay on the right side of that line? Thank you. Um, before we get to the audience, I'd, I'd like to ask Victor and Aunt Marie to say a bit more about the efforts underway right now to launch the next commission, because this is, I believe, going to be a very important step and piece of the story of what follows Hong Kong. And it's, as I said in my opening remarks, it's a companion of sorts with the WHO Advisory Committee just launched. Victor, what can you tell us? Well, first of all, the summit, which was organized by the academies, uh, made that statement you heard from Anne Marie. Uh, they do not necessarily a formal statement of the academy. So what happened is, Marshall McNutt and I uh, also made a statement supporting, in fact, the summit uh, organizers' uh, overall, shall we say, condemnation of what's happened. But perhaps more importantly, we realize that something needs to be done. And the question we have asked ourselves is, what can be done to get a lot more clarity about the situation conditions by which what would consider or not uh, germline editing? So that's what we said. So we wrote in a editorial science together with the Royal Society president to call for an international action to bring together all the major academies, not only science, but medicine, social science of the world, to come together and say, if we all agree on the conditions, thereby we'll have, in fact, general, let me use the word loosely, consensus, right? And that is obviously very important, because I remember that uh, Jeff and I and Jennifer Doudna appeared before Congress, remember? I do. They asked whether one can have an international treaty that was a big issue. Of course, we know that that's simply not doable because countries are so different. But we feel that if we had, we very clear on the conditions that ranges from which condition would you even consider, what kind of criteria do you need to meet, and then how do you sh make sure that it's safe, and what are the regulation conditions to know it's safe to proceed 
And then what about ethical framework? That would be important. Now, we've been criticized by others in at the National Academy, we've been criticized. Now, first report might not be specific enough that, as he said, might have opened the door. So we felt that maybe this is time that we need to do a more definitive one that gets down to this. Without any bias, we still have to ask the question, should this be done at all? So therefore, there's in fact a whole group of people who say moratorium, I'm not sure how many years. I mean, moratorium is until it's ready. It's not five years, it's simply may or may not be enough. But the idea of moratorium, not a ban, is the way to go by which we have more time to say, what are those issues to be addressed? For example, people argue that today, with uh, IVF, because this will be the condition by which you can do gene editing and then reimplant the embryo, you can do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So most of the condition you really worried about would be, in fact, predetermined, and those embryos can be discarded. That being said, we do know there are conditions where a, a couple both carry a dominant gene of a monogenic disease where there's no way they can have babies because they'll for sure get the disease, right? So that becomes a real issue. So do these conditions need to be met? And what about the ethical framework? So we need to examine those and be very clear on those conditions. I think importantly, when, as Jeff said, we don't know the safety, we don't know the long-term effect, how do you actually go forward? Well, you know, we don't know every drug's long-term effect. We don't know drugs will be safe forever. So maybe using the same kind of regulatory thinking that we need people who regulate to say, if you meet these conditions, animal studies, multi-generation, ah, maybe you can move forward. But that has to be, again, defined and met. And then, of course, the consent ethics, who is doing the oversight? In the Hearst case, he went to one IRB in local hospital. The university didn't even know about this. Maybe there ought to be another layer, like we have now recombinant DNA committee, RAC, that used to look at all gene therapy. So, that's the purpose of this whole report, that we really want to get real specificity, buy-in from, we now have some 20 or so international academies, so everybody's saying, yes, we are singing from the song, same script. So that will allow governments and others to make those decisions. Now they have the information, how they regulate it in the context of their society and culture, which leads to the WHO, uh, panel that you want to say a word about? Yeah, let me also add to what Dr. Zhao said about what the commission, the NAS, <coughs> NAM, and Royal Society Commission will do. They also are, as he said, talk about this oversight structure, but one of the key things they want to look at, and this is in light of Dr. He, is what do scientists do if they find out that someone's doing something that um, they shouldn't be doing? And so we want to figure out what that mechanism might be that would allow a scientist to come forth and bring their concerns. With respect to the WHO, I think many of you know that they had their meeting about, I think it was a week ago in Geneva. The committee's being uh, co-chaired by Peggy Hammer, Hamburg, the former um, head of the FDA, and uh, Justice Cam it was Cameron, Cameron. Right, right, um, from South, South Africa, if I have that correct. And um, uh, as you might imagine, a very international uh, committee with also uh, scientists, ethicists, and uh, legal scholars. At their me first meeting, they spent, um, as might be imagined, most of their attention on uh, their charge or the statement of work and figuring out how they were going to operationalize that. At the end of their um, uh, first day meeting, uh, they did come out with a statement and um, they indicated that um, they thought that there was a need for three basic principles that they had reached agreement on. One was transparency, which in their mind led them to make the recommendation for a registry for all somatic and germline editing um, and a requirement that journals make certain that anyone who publishes, submits a paper has registered and that funders also make certain that they've registered. Um, they also called for the principle of inclusivity, which means serving the WHO, serving as an information resource. And then finally, for responsibility. And in that one, they called for, uh, once again, they made the statement that it'd be irresponsible to do germline editing. Now, this is unusual for WHO to take on this kind of advisory, hosting an advisory committee on a cutting edge technology. This hasn't been done before. Victor? I think their charge is because there are 190 member states want to know what to do with this technology. So let me put into context our International Commission and WHO. Right. These are the two, to my knowledge, 
the main bodies who's addressing this. So when it comes together, they're highly complementary. WHO charge at the end of the day is governance. What do we tell our countries? What do you use to decide in the context of your own society and culture what to do? Ours is more related to science, medicine, and to some extent, medical ethics. So our report will feed into the WHO report. And we are now in coordination. And Marie, in fact, represent us at the WHO meeting. So our report with Katie Bowman's hard work will be done in about 10 months. And the WHO <laughs> report is about 18 months to even two years. So they, we've done this with them before in the Ebola outbreak, that we actually communicate with each other so that mm -hmm. our thinking helps them think about how to create a governance framework and guidance. And that's our belief. Thank you. So with those three reports, I think we are in really much better shape. Tim? Yeah, I think just building on that and something Jeff said earlier, um, CRISPR gene editing does demand a different global playbook, in my view. And, and Victor cited one important work uh, from Huxley in 1932. I'm going to cite another one. Who has seen Rampage with The Rock? Starring The Rock. Who's seen? No. All right, it's a th thin show of hands. Uh, uh, well, if you want to know what you do with a free time. The way I think about it, if you're working on a technology where you need The Rock to save Chicago from a flying wolf, a giant gorilla, and an alligator the size of a building, you need a different playbook. And, and that's where we are, because there's probably got to be something, Jeff said it, that's set up differently with a global framework, maybe led by the WHO or some other new entity and some local framework that's different because this does get to issues around what does it mean to be yeah. a human? And, and I, I'm frankly not super comfortable with either extreme, right? It's all done just locally uh, where any country could say, well, we're gonna do whatever we want. We don't care what the rest of the world thinks. Think of rogue countries or just a purely global structure where there's no real oversight local. I, I can't see how either one of those would practically work. And because I think these are issues that we need to figure out for gene editing in the near term. But you can imagine a world in which in a decade or two, some other hot technology comes along where we're going to need similar regulation and oversight. We probably ought to t take the time to do a lot of convening to get this right. Because I think we'll look back and people will look back in 50 years and be really glad that we had the Victors and the Jeffs and the Emerys around to help solve these complex problems. Can I, can I say one thing yes, about please. this? So, there are um, approaches that the global community has accepted for how we move forward in clinical trials, right? We do consent of human subjects and we have a uh, collecting of data and reporting of results. The problem is it won't work in this context. Like, you can't get consent from someone who doesn't exist yet, right? So the, the structures that we have put in place as ethics concepts that have been made into policy just are insufficient. So. Part of the goal, I think, of the WHO committee and, and in a kind of really concrete nuts and bolts ways, the commission that Victor and Anne Marie are talking about will, will provide that or work to provide that. Right. Good luck with that. I hope you have a, you know, it, it's not straightforward, <laughs> but that's what we need. I mean, yeah, but my, that's, my that's, sense from yeah. listening to you all and, and <laughs> earlier conversations is that the commission is going to focus on the translational pathway, on the science, mm -hmm. the issues of how to get closer to clinical applications to understand the requirements. The WHO piece is on the broad governance. Right. In international governance, right? Yeah. International yeah. governance, yeah. right? And that's where they, they, they sink But I, I think the governance require the translational piece. Yeah, you because need until you understand how to regulate, mm -hmm. how to move this forward, you can't have a governance structure, right? Unless you can say we totally prohibit it. And certainly I think laws are so different from country to country, some countries totally prohibit any embryo application, and others are a lot more open to it. That brings me to, I wanted to ask Jeffrey to illuminate for it, for this audience, the current law in the United States. And you know, what is, what is the law today and policy, and what does that mean in terms of the ability of the US scientific community to operate looking into the future in terms of, of germline applications, clinical applications. So I, I want to say first that the uh, that work involving somatic modification is, is well regulated and there's a clear pathway and that's the, the work that companies like um, Editas are engaged in. Um, it is, um, on the other hand, it is currently illegal in the United States for anybody to submit 
to the FDA, a license application that involves the heritable genetic change of a human embryo or a cell that has been created through that process. So, so the FDA can't even receive an application to begin a clinical trial. So that's in a that blanket area. prohibition. Correct. And so it, it, you, if you want to be able to do this, you need to go through the FDA because the FDA, one, regulates whether you can sell something, right, in the biomedical sphere. And the second is that they have asserted that in certain areas of reproductive technologies, and this would qualify, they have a jurisdiction, they have authority. So um, it is currently prohibited in the United States. So that may sound like a, a sort of, you can sleep better at night now as a result. Um, I don't believe that that's the case because what that has indicated is you're not welcome here and so you should go find another place to do this work, which is not good for oversight and responsible science going forward. It's not great for U.S. Uh, competitive science. Um, and I don't think we want to see leadership in you know, how we think about appropriate oversight of leading edge controversial science. So for me, that's not the right answer. And it, it came about as part of the budget uh, reconciliation process at the end of 2015. Am I getting that right, Tim? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it predated any of this um, discussion about twins being born in China. Um, but it has implications for what could or couldn't be done in the context of this conversation. And politically and culturally, it would be very difficult to lift that prohibition. Uh, I, I, that's my view. I would say the one thing that may um, give uh, the members of Congress some reason to rethink that is if they start to hear that we're losing the, the race, the science race, and the implications of that from a competitive, competitiveness and an economic perspective. I think actually uh, we have somewhat of a convoluted approach to this issue. You call it prohibition. They basically say we will not fund FDA to review any of these applications. That to me is different from you have a law, you break, you go to jail, yeah. which is what happened in China. They have a 2013 yeah. embryo yeah, right, law, yeah. as is also in Germany and others. Yeah. Right? So there's a whole spectrum of this. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think we are kind of dancing around the issue. I'm not taking which position, but you know, we won't fund embryo research by the government, but the private sector can do it, right? Mm -hmm. Or stem cell research and that we will not review these things because we won't fund you to review them versus we say just not allowed. So I do think there's some leeway for this kind of okay. way to relook at them. But you can also look at the stem cell legacy as a comparative point of comparison, right? Yeah, private in sector is good. In terms of how yeah. things have evolved. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would just say maybe kind of starting top and moving down. It's my understanding that, that germline editing is prohibited in 30 or 40 countries, I think around the world. So the US, much of Europe, if not all of Europe, many other parts of the world, and, and I think we've clarified now China, right? Um, there have been calls for a global ban, or, or more, sorry, a global moratorium on germline editing, and that's a, there are pros and cons, I think, to that. And then in the United States, we have, as Jeff articulated um, a prohibition that goes back to 2015. I've heard people say, geez, it's, it's, it, in some ways it was helpful to have the US uh, prohibition, the Aderholt Amendment in place after Hong Kong because what could have resulted in a panic if that weren't in place? And I probably side in that camp more than not. Um, but I think it's a fair debate to be had and I don't doubt this debate will, will go on for years ahead. It's one of the reasons why I think it is critically important that we bring a lot of diverse stakeholders together to have these debates. These are gonna, these should take place. They will be loud, messy, there'll be disagreements. There should be people from patient organizations, the disability rights communities, religious views, ethicists, scientists, biotech companies, all together hashing this stuff out. We gotta get good at this because we're gonna need it for some years to come is my view. Thank Can you. I say something about, so the, the, it could have been worse argument to me is more a statement about the way we make policy in these areas, right? To Victor's point, than it is about that was appropriate. And I think we, you know, it isn't the way of sort of a, a through going look at, at what the implications of these policies are and, and um, acknowledging how to move forward in a responsible way, exactly. which is what I think we ought to be That's doing. That's what I'm saying. Let's open to our audience. We'll take a number of comments and questions and bundle them together. There's one person right here. Please identify yourself. Be very succinct. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay, thank you for a very interesting panel. Uh, Robin Forsberg, John Hopkins, Sites. So my question is on the technical limitations of gene editing. So if you read uh, Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World or, or Yuval Harari's Homo Deus, you get the picture, it's a piece of cake. You know, uh, we can have high IQ in the, fam in, in the future, we can make our bodies more beautiful. But is it really so? Because my picture is that it's super difficult. There's a lot of complications to this. And uh, like, what is the reality, the, the science around this? Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Right here. Please identify yourself. And oh, sure. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm Tim McDonald. I'm a journalist. And um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the girls in this particular case and um, what happens now uh, you know, as we're kind of working on developing these guidelines for the future, and the genie is sort of out of the bottle in this one case. So what is your recommendation for how um, we should kind of be watching this? Um, and uh, yeah, and then also uh, just a second part is um, if you're worried at all that another rogue or um, actor could, that this could happen again before you have a time to settle on the things that are being discussed. No. Thank you. Right here and right there. Sammy, yeah, go. Yes, sir. I, I'm a retired uh, neurologist, and uh, just a question for you is, uh, what went wrong with the legal guidelines between U.S. and China as far as Dr. He's work is concerned? And two rows back. Hi, um, Megan Stark, genetics PhD candidate and policy fellow at the National Academy of Sciences. One thing that I uh, would really love to hear from the panel are discussions surrounding the issues of genetic um, uh, manipulation and inequality. Um, so, uh, you know, IVF is incredibly expensive and it's already, the cost of IVF is already something that's incredibly limiting for a lot of people. And so, if this is a technology that were to ever become publicly available, what, are the, what does that look like for broadly for the citizens of this country who are already economically disadvantaged? Thank Great you. Question. Back, well, let's take one more. Uh, my name is Ock Pannenberg. I am retired. I used to be the technical health director at the World Bank and its chief health scientist. As you hear from my accent, I'm from the Netherlands and I grew up in Germany. The, my question is, I have two questions. One is, could any one of you comment on the overlap between human research in this field and veterinary research and any kind of governance or agreements with the veterinary research world? The second question is, um, could you comment possibly on the current status vis-a-vis -vis the historical evolvements of the Nuremberg agreements and subsequently the Helsinki experimentation agreements um, to put it very bluntly I'm sure in a kind of ironic circle that Dr. Himmler and Dr. Mengele would love this. So you said Victor that a treaty is out of the question but why and could you comment in this context? Okay, let's return uh, to our speakers who look a little stunned. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll get to you in the next right. round, okay? Um, who would like to jump in first? I'll take on the signs and also the equity okay. issue, because this is what we think a lot about. On the signs, uh, you are right in the sense that not everything's worked out. Uh, however, it's moving at lightning sp pace. It's now possible to do single base editing, not just a whole sequence editing. So even though we still believe there may be off-target effects, et cetera, but increasingly it's showing that that's less and less likely. Now in the embryo, it's a little more complicated because you want to be sure when you introduce the embryo that every cell have the copy, right? And so therefore, the issue of mosaicism is the question. When do you introduce it? One cell stage? two cell states, so there's still some work to be done. But I will tell you, science is not going to be the bottleneck in this issue. Science is going to move forward and it will get there and get there fairly quickly, right? So the question about uh, the traits that you're talking about really has to more do we understand 
the genetic basis of the trait. That's actually slower than the technology itself, right? For a long time, lots of technology were available, antisense, you name it. It's until we understand the genetic basis by which we can target those treatments. That piece is still not there, particularly in complex traits like intelligence, like you know, looks, physical uh, stature, et cetera. So I think that's where the answer is. I think the issue of equity is so, so, so important. Jeff and I talked about this on the way over here. Emma Marie and I are working on this. We believe this is a substantial issue that needs to be addressed, not only this technology, but technology as a whole, right? IVF is really expensive, and this is coupled with IVF. So I can imagine that it's not going to be easily assessed with a lot of people. But I'm also worried about the rogue activity. IVF, in some places, are not regulated, even in the US, right? And we do know in the mitochondrial replacement therapy, a US uh, in which, uh, uh, what is a specialist went to Mexico to do replacement therapy. So what I'm saying is, is the issue is really big, big, big. And I think we are very, very, uh, shall we say, committed, right, Jeff? <laughs> and then we need to address the issue at the National Academy. You should come and talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say something about the, the question raised about treaty? Oh, my. No, I was I, hoping that one I, of you guys would take this <laughs> off. You get a start. <laughs> Jeff, do you want to say about more? treaties? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not a, a international law and politics person. I think it seems like a really difficult path. That, so that's my, you know, very quick answer. If it were an e if there were an easy model, then obviously we would not be sitting here wondering what we're going to do. Treaties we're having to create something a little bit de novo, and that I think is um, among the challenges. It's interesting to me that the WHO committee went straight to uh, international biomedical journal publishers. It's sort of where, where is there a borderless oversight mechanism? And one, the one answer that we all sort of immediately go to is, well, if you want to publish a paper, it doesn't matter if you live in China or the United States, if you apply to science, you, you send it to science to be published, you have to follow the criteria that they that they um, implement, and that includes you follow human subjects protections, you follow animal subjects protections, you have to check boxes about whether you did enough work to actually be listed as an author. So if you could say, and you followed the human genome editing you know, guidance. Well, that's the model of creating a sort of soft, system, soft regulatory it's, it's, system, it's soft, an ecosystem right. in which to be a card-carrying scientist, you're going to have to be in the club on right. multiple and you, levels, and, the and incentive if you get is you booted out of the, the club, club. Yeah. you're right. not going to be allowed back into the diamond right. exchange. And the incentive yes. is you want to be in the club. And, and, and to, so to that point, the first paper that you mentioned, Anne-Marie, that was published in whatever year that was, 2015, 15, yeah. was not published in Science or okay. Nature right. or Cell. It was published in a relatively you know, third, fourth tier journal, not because it wasn't really interesting leading edge sciences because it was too hot to touch. The scientific you know, journal publishers didn't want to publish an article of that, had, that yeah. showed editing of human on embryos. This, on this question of treaties. And can, can I weigh in on this publication sure. first? It, it's, if people don't need to publish it in no, order to a, advertise, a, they can a, do it. It's right? a poor hook. Right? No, my it's, point was so, if that's the best we can do, yeah. that shows yeah. you that we don't have right. good models. No, but I think yeah. all the chair one of our members talk about multi-layer governance. Yeah. Publication is only one of them. There could be, you know, we know about funding, yeah. multi-layer. You probably need a multi-layer governance, yeah. but she is the expert on treaty. Okay. Uh, uh, Katie, you're welcome to weigh in here. I just want to add one point, which is, you know, when you look at the world of global health, you have the international health regulations, you have IHR, you have the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. You do have, you don't have a lot of negotiated treaties in this world of, of health, of global health. But what you would need in order to get to a treaty would be a, a pretty, a, a sense of an urgent problem, right? right? Yeah. And you would have to have leadership deciding to bite this off and go at it because getting the renewal and updating of IHR took SARS and, and, and pandemic flu and the tobacco took Gro Brundtland deciding I've had enough, I'm gonna stake my entire uh, tenure on this and take on this industry. If you had, you can imagine some future scenarios where uh, you could have bad actors beginning to accumulate 
in, in the darker spots or darker corners in ways that people find truly repugnant and pernicious and in which you might have more motivation at a diplomatic level to move that forward. But we're not at that point yet, I think. But I think you're suggesting we might get to that point. I think that's, um, if I'm reading between the lines a little bit. Katie, did you want to add anything? Um, no, we can chat later. I think you have a lot of things to address. <laughs> All right, Anne-Marie, can you talk about the question raised by Tim around the girls, and are we right. worried? So um, I think we're all worried. We don't know much, and there hasn't been um, uh, many reports at all about the girls. And it's not just, I think, uh, the girls and how they will have to or will they be followed for the rest of their lives and what will we know about them as they um, age. But we also know that there was an announcement of a second pregnancy. And we've heard nothing more about that. So whether that pregnancy is still viable um, or not, we don't know. And when that baby is born, will we know? Um, so there's a lot of unknown questions. And I think um, it's uh, beholden upon the scientific community to try to get to, to the answers, to understand what is happening. But we also have to remember, we have to respect the privacy of these uh, girls. So I think it's a very complicated um, issue in which we don't have a lot of information at this are point. Their, their identities are secret now? It's still Lulu and yeah, Nana. No one knows where right. they are. Yeah. Can I According to Chinese question? law, at least for HIV patients, there's total privacy. And uh, they don't disclose identity. Now, these kids they don't, are, have, don't have HIV, right. but they were. I mean, this is, I heard the argument for some of this. I have no idea what's going to be disclosed. I, could I just add also to this issue of complexity um, and traits and genes and the interaction? I think one of the things the commission hopes to do is recognizing that, that they want to lay out where do we really know enough about um, the genetic makeup and traits and things of that where we would feel comfortable, if it's deemed permissible to do this, to move in that direction of application. And then there's going to be, I think, a lot where we don't know and what we'll want is a lot of basic research that just keeps educating us. And so I can imagine that one would, do, this is even Evolving, that you may, may, if you de deem it permissible, say that these are some areas where you can do work, and but we're not there on all these other areas. Can Tim, did really you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Jeff. I, I want to be really uh, uh, short about the about the, the twins. So it's really important information because they're the first if if they exist. So we want to collect that data so that we can answer the questions about safety and, and mm -hmm. certainty. There won't be many babies. Born, presumably, right? This is not going to be thousands of children. So we, we need to collect the data that we can get and for as long as we can. There's a conundrum here, though, in that it was unethical science. And we don't tend to publish or want to promote results from unethical science. So we have this funny kind of, we need this data critically, right, to start answering these questions, but we don't like the way it was obtained or, or created, as to your point about the Third Reich. And we, we tend to say we, we better not, we should not, as a moral matter, use the data that came from, from Auschwitz, right? Or should we, as a matter of honoring the legacy of the people who died at the hands of, of such evildoers, right? This is a, a long-standing issue which gets brought out yet again in 2018. Thank you. We have a question right here. And we'll take uh, Nellie in front. Yes, please. Um. Eileen Schaffness, former director of the Forum on uh, Microbial Threats within the National Academy of Medicine, and mo more recently, subject matter expert on CRISPR-Cas9 uh, patent dispute between uh, UC Berkeley and uh, the Ooh. Broad Institute. However, um, <laughs> uh, following up on the more recent comment about the use of uh, data from Auschwitz uh, and some trepidation about using that in honor of the uh, sacrifices uh, that um, uh, people made uh, that were not of their own volition. The U.S. was perfectly willing to use uh, data obtained from uh, Unit 731 uh, in the aftermath of World War II uh, to augment its biological weapons program. And we shared those data with the UK, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. So we don't come into this with completely um, uh, clean hands. However, uh, with regard to uh, the issue of international prohibitions on doing certain things, we have international prohibitions on doing certain things. 
We have the Geneva Convention. We have the Biological Weapons Convention. Right. We have the Chemical Weapons Convention. Right. All of these international treaties establish certain norms of behavior. They may not always be um, met under all circumstances by all administrations under every decade. However, they are still international norms and people can in fact create in, an international norm that is flexible for a lot of mm. situations for research using CRISPR-Cas9, not just for human somatic and germ <coughs> cell editing, but also in plant as well as veterinary settings as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd add to that the Vienna Conventions on drug, international drugs. I mean, you, Again, you've I got, want, you, I, I think that's an excellent, yeah. I think your point is an excellent point. Nellie. Hi, Nellie Bristol with CSIS. Tim, I was wondering if you can talk about some of the um, therapies that your company is developing and walk through the informed consent process that would happen with, say, for example, you were talking about childhood blindness. Like, how, how does that work? Do we have any other, this is, this, we're going to, uh, come back to our speakers and then we'll close. Right here. CJ, did you have a question? Okay, we'll get to you in just one second. Hi, I'm Niklas Hapaschos. I'm a business student, so not the same background here, but if we suppose that we have um, a consent on the ethical views on an international level or even national, and the technology is far enough to implement it in a day-to-day -day basis, how do we prevent a black market for human enhancement or illegal stuff when it's so easy to do it. If we allow it to become so common, we can't protect us from, from any stuff that we don't want even though we agree on it on an ethical basis. Are there any technological mechanisms how we can control it or just check for it? Thank you. CJ. Yeah, my, my question has to, well, first of all, thank you to all the panelists. It's been a very interesting conversation. But my question has to do with the last two questions. And um, I wonder if the panelists could opine maybe on where you see us in tw 10, 20 years with, as they've um, highlighted and Mr. Um, Khan highlighted, that the, the bar to entry is so low that we don't even have laws for moratoriums and, and international um, bans on these things. What is, where do you see um, this technology uh, going forward where it could start with the scientific community just um, focusing on uh, uh, actual diseases, but then can it go um, somewhere else with say, designer babies and, and things of that nature. Thank you, CJ. So what I'm going to suggest we do is go down to Jeff and work our way this direction. And uh, Jeff, you begin by responding to those questions that are relevant to you. And we'll move to Anne-Marie. And then when we get down at this end, I'm going to ask Victor to do the benediction. Oh. <laughs> Jeff. Oh, oh. <laughs> I wasn't taking great notes about which questions were relevant to me, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually take the consent question that maybe Tim can speak to as well. I served on the recombinant DNA advisory committee, the so-called RAC, which Victor mentioned, when the drug that became the Spark Therapeutics drug for um, treatment of gener genetic inherited forms of blindness was being considered in its early phase. Um, so that's the body that reviews gene transfer, so-called gene therapy research in, in humans. And it, you must get approval from that body advisory to the director of the NIH before you can go forward. And what was really interesting about that particular story, which was, um, was and is for children, is that the parents of, of those children, first of all, um, there, there are no other treatments. There's no alternatives. It was very promising in animal studies. And so this is the first time in humans it was being offered. And uh, uh, they showed a video I remember very clearly of a, a child walking through a, a, a maze, which is how they set up and assess uh, levels of vision. 
um, before and after one eye being treated. And it was remarkable to watch this child stumble into the obstacles in the before film and then navigate it very easily in the after. And the, the question wasn't so much about whether it could go forward as a clinical trial, but whether parents should be permitted to give consent to having both eyes of their children um, uh, injected at the same time. So the question was, do we know enough about this very novel, first in human um, use of a, a therapy to say we're willing to let you risk your child's vision because we don't know the long-term effects of this and whether it would, you know, the child's um, restored vision would, would last or plummet you know, and, and go away after a few weeks. And the parents said, let us make the decision about um, preserving whatever vision our child may have. The sooner you treat these kids, the more vision you preserve, it turns out. So um, what I learned from that was that's not consent in the sense that we really wish for it. There isn't good, there aren't good alternatives. And these parents were willing to do anything for their children to, res to preserve, restore um, their vision, understandably. Um, so I does, it doesn't, consent doesn't work in the way that I think we hope it will in some of these first in human, devastating diseases, no other therapy context. People will do anything effectively. So it's, it's a sort of insufficient um, tool for, I think, doing the ethics work that I think your question implies. Maybe we can talk about it after. So I, I don't have a good um, alternative, but I, I'm just telling you in lived experience, it's, it's really challenging. Um, the second thing I'll say, and really quickly, because I know you want to work your way down, Stephen, is the, what I took to be the off-label use question, the sort of how are we going to prevent this from being used in ways that are about enhancement. Um, and I think that's a huge challenge. It's already been proven in, in one of the related areas, mitochondria replacement, where all of the uh, bodies that opined on how, how to use it and when said very limited circumstances for really devastating mitochondrial DNA diseases, and that immediately became used for women with uh, um, fertility issues, being offered in Kiev at clinics that are overseen or at least um, informed by uh, European and uh, U.S. reproductive technology physicians. So off-label use is a huge problem that there isn't an obvious um, way to address, at least in the U.S. context. Yep. Anne Marie? Um, let me just add a little bit more to what Jeff said and just to suggest that we're really at the start of the, I think what will be the century of biology and that we're going to see more and more technologies come at us faster and faster and that we've got to figure out better mechanisms, I think, for the scientific community to engage with the public, to engage with ethicists, with lawyers, with um, all different types of stakeholders. Um, there are so many emerging technologies, I think, that we're going to see that will go to the big question that was raised by Steve in the beginning of what it means to be human, and that we have a responsibility to be figuring out ways to govern emerging technologies and to work together on figuring out what that is so that the rogue actor or the ex expanding way beyond what we ever envisioned can be addressed. Jim? Yeah, two things. One, on the informed consent, Jeff said much of it, and, and a lot of it is the way we think about it. It's building off of the last 30 years of experience with gene therapy technologies. It is tricky when you have a, a new modality, right? It's, it, that, that does make it a little bit more complex. I would say we also do pledge, like gene therapy companies, to follow patients for 15 years to monitor safety. And, and frankly, outside of informed consent, we, hear, we talk to patients all the time. They're also like, some are extremely excited, and some are really, I want to wait and see. You know, I've built my life with my child around their condition the way they are. I love them where they are, how they are. Um, and let's just kind of take it slow and wait and see. And we think that's a great approach, too. Um, I would say on the convention piece, I agree with what Anne-Marie just said. I, I do think you know, if you step back a little bit, these events in Hong Kong, for many of us, were sad and tragic, among other things, to see playing out, right, with Dr. Hay. Um, the way I think about it is, and maybe this is the optimist to me, but how do we take something like that and turn it into something positive? And, and that, I think, does get to how do we think about these this sort of different playbook around an appropriate global and more local regulatory framework because the, we've got to really figure out three things around germ, germline editing, it strikes me, in big buckets. The science, which is still very emergent, the kind of ethical, legal, regulatory framework, and as a society, 
getting together and hashing some of this stuff out. Those three legs of the stool are needed, in my view, before germline gene editing could really go forward in a practical way. Okay, Victor. Uh, enhancement is a tough issue. I'll say that <coughs> enhancement through embryo manipulation, you're not gonna see that for a while. Uh, I think everybody pretty much agrees that's the last, you know, uh, the highest bar in terms of ethics, you know, we talk about curing disease. But enhancement using gene editing in somatic is certainly possible. For example, we do know that if you can, uh, in the condition called Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, you can simply inject gene editing tools to fix that gene. 10, 15 percent of your muscle is sufficient to actually enable uh, mobility and all this stuff. So you can easily imagine that we think about what can be done in enhancement locally in the muscle and somewhere, you can suddenly now enable enhancement and performance of this. So I do worry about that quite a bit. In the public opinion, when it comes to what, do, what does public think in genetic modification, and they mainly think about embryo, I would say that uh, we just talked about the Pew Research Center shows about 67% of people say it should be used for a devastating disease, and much fewer people think about, fewer people say it, sh it should be used for enhancement. So you're quite right. I mean, this is a whole spectrum. I would imagine people begin to do enhancement much earlier in the somatic form, but not in the embryo approach. Okay, so uh, benediction. Yes. Thank you. Mm. Great job. Um, I want to thank uh, particularly Steve and his staff for pulling it together, and Steve is certainly. For somebody who's into everything, this is not your area, and you did a great job. <laughs> and, uh, but also, of course, the uh, panelists who are really experts who are together, and all of you, in helping us address a very important issue. So thank you. Stay tuned, as they say. There's a lot more work to be done. I agree with what's been said by Emory and others. I think the big issue is Science, technology, moving lightning speed. Look at Facebook and others. We need to start get ready. Your question about equity to really address the multitude of issues that arise from science and technology. And it's not just one. It's not ethics only. It's many other issues, legal issues, many other issues. So I think our job is really interested in pulling together all the stakeholders to work together to create a framework whereby people can say, if we have something new coming out, how do we very early start addressing some of those issues and do it together? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much to all of my colleagues for this and to the Academy for partnering with us. And we will, I think we'll want to return to this topic yes. soon, later this year. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you.